Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, apologies for missing last week's excitement and the week before, but somebody's got to be on vacation. So that was going to be me. <laughs> so I was up in the wilds of uh, the Canadian Rockies with all the smoke, but it was a lot of fun. Um, so and I want to take a moment and just congratulate um, the, the new TSC and give my thanks to Greg and Ram for their, uh, for their service for the past two and a half years. Um, because I think it, John, Jonathan actually. And Jonathan. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, and, uh, and thank them for their, uh, for their efforts because it's, it's been, uh, it's been great thus far. And, uh, so congratulations to the newest members. Uh, on our agenda this morning, we have uh, our usual event reminders. Um, we've got the TSC chair selection process that Todd will go over. Um, we have a community health working group discussion. Uh, and then we have uh, our bevy of updates composer, I think, is um, Simon on. Yeah, I'm here, Chris. Hello. All right. Thanks, Simon. And Cello, do we have who's doing that? Awa or? We have a new maintainer, Luke Chen from WeWare. He will do the report. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And then we have no uh, working group updates this week, but next week we have architecture working group. And we also have the Hyperledger Explorer update the following week. So, um, and then just, uh, I don't know if Tracy's on, when are we gonna get closure on the copyright stuff? I know that it's tough with everybody traveling. We've, and we've got a legal committee call scheduled uh, for next week, September 5th, I believe. So that went out to all the premier member legal counsel, which is how that's, okay. that, that and did you fine. get a, Response from Jerry. I, I not, honestly not yet. He is okay. I'll I'll post Peter. I think he's on holiday though. But but that is scheduled, so it's it's moving forward. Yep. Okay. Super duper. All right. Any other items for the agenda? Hearing none. Let's move on. So Todd, take it away. All right. Uh, super quick on the event stuff. Hackfest, October third and fourth, Montreal. Please get registered for that. Um, it's gonna up registration quickly um, but going on from there looking at q1 uh, of next year uh, please let us know your availability and the doodle poll we want to get that scheduled well in advance um, oh so going back to Montreal quick heads up we already have 86 registered for that so that's extremely healthy uh, for you know about a month out uh, anyone else please get your name in there ASAP and then the last piece on the event front is Hyperledger Global Forum. Yesterday morning, the full schedule and keynotes were announced for that. So uh, two days focused on business and technical tracks, as well as a wide set of keynotes. And then two days after that, uh, more on the workshops and labs front. So please take a look at the schedule there uh, as, um, and get registered if you're planning to head to that. It's going to be a great event for the entire ecosystem. Any questions on those three events? All right, uh, so quick heads up on the next uh, part. Uh, as Chris said, the new TSC was formally elected uh, as of uh, Wednesday night last week. So now the 11 TSC members are voting on the chair for the next 12 months. Uh, Chris Ferris and Dan Middleton uh, were the two nominees for that. Uh, so that election for chair will conclude on Wednesday of next week. So we'll get that announced out with the agenda uh, and just congratulate the winner from that on, on Thursday. And with that, I think it brings it over to Rye, Rye, Rye Tracy yep. on the community health uh, discussion. <clears throat> sure, thanks. Um, we have, we, Tracy, um, David Boswell, and I had been discussing how to uh, gauge community health. And uh, we fortuitously uh, circulated this community health working group charter um, right before the very robust discussion about um, diversity in our working groups and in Hyperledger overall. Um, 
we had a few comments from Dan Nolden, uh, Hart Montgomery, and uh, Mark Wagner. And we are looking for uh, more commentary. What we want to do is to be able to measure the health with you know objective um, with objective metrics that the community agrees on and present reports moving forward on the health of, of, of our projects and our working groups. And uh, we would like to bring this to the TSC for the vote for formation uh, next week. So I would really appreciate, uh, you know, any questions or commentary and anyone has any questions. Or Tracy, do you have any Thing further to add? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, if there's uh, any thoughts that you have in, in kind of the next week, if you could review the, the document uh, charter that we put out there for the uh, Community Health Work Working Group, um, we would highly appreciate that so that we can update it uh, in time for the, the hopeful vote next week. Now, I, I would view something like this almost as somehow morphing some of this into a checklist for deciding if something's ready to be a project, right? We, we'd have a set of guidelines that we're looking for for health of a working group or a project. And then as we're deciding if we accept something down the road, you know, we could say, well, are they going to be able to meet these things, right? Is, is that part of what you're thinking with this? Uh, I mean, I think when we really put it together, we were only thinking about the, the projects that exist in the umbrella, I'm sorry, the greenhouse today. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's a, a lot of things that we could do in, in looking at community health. If that is, you know, um, something that we think it might be useful for, then we can definitely put a, um, you know, as we kind of figure out what those things are that we want to look at, we can... Uh, think about how that would impact incoming projects as well, or even uh, maybe these uh, working group proposals, right? Cool, thanks. Yeah. This, this is Vipin. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is there's already a framework around reporting the health of the projects and working groups to the uh, TSC. So will this be yet another way to report on the health and what about the health of the community health working group who is going to uh police the policers um so <laughs> you know this this uh this uh proliferation of i mean it is a good thing to have a community health working group they should be uh assisting others uh in in uh, constituting not only the working group, but also to spread the word about the working group, that would be a good thing. But to have another group that is just responsible for measuring other groups, that doesn't seem like a useful exercise. So how I read this proposal <clears throat> uh, is looking at investigating what's working and what's not working and what kind of uh, might not be in there explicitly, but what, what kind of patterns can we identify in projects that have uh, healthier communities that we can help encourage in in projects that might not have reached that same level of success? Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a good way of saying that, Dan, right? I think, you know, we can learn from one another, right? As, uh, I mean, that's part of why Hyperledger exists and why a number of different projects exist is to be able to share best practices yeah. and, and those sorts of things. And so um, I think you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head, Dan, with where we were at, right? Uh, some, some things are going to be healthier, right? And it may, it may not be the same thing, right? So it's different projects may be healthier in different areas um, and, and the projects can learn from one another. So um, yeah, definitely uh, so, something we're thinking about. But isn't, so, so, and again, apologies because I missed the conversation previously. We haven't had but, one. So. Um, isn't this what we do with the quarterly reports, as Vipin is sort of strongly hinting at, where we already have identified a set of things that we'd like people to come back and report on, such as maintainer diversity, although, again, diversity is a different 
facets of diversity, obviously, um, contributors and so forth, um, as well as continue, you know, so all of those things, I think we had robust discussion and debate in the TSC previously about what should go into the quarterly reports. And I think that the quarterly reports themselves have been an effective means of stimulating conversation amongst the TSC and with the members of the various projects on, you know, providing coming up with suggestions on how they can improve and so forth. Isn't that, so, so I guess my point is, I, I don't disagree that this kind of a dialogue isn't useful. I'm struggling a little bit with, and how is that different than what we're doing with the quarterly reports and maybe then applying a little bit more formal um, uh, methods to identifying things like how many contributors, diversity, you know, maintainers, all that stuff, and just maintaining some sort of a dashboard. I, I'm, I, again, I, I don't want to say that we shouldn't have this conversation. I'm hoping that that's, in fact, the point of the quarterly updates is to continue to see what's going on with the projects and for those that are struggling a little bit to have the wisdom of this team and others, you know, shared with those teams to, to, to help them improve. Chris, I think one way to think of this would be one step more meta than that. It's, uh, um, you know, what, what are the kind, uh, it, it isn't intended to replace or duplicate the uh, quarterly reports. Um, it's, I think, intended to be a place to say, to talk, have a discussion in a more, uh, you know, out, um, out of band uh, from, the, from the technical steering committee kind of way of what should those health reports say? You know what? It, what are the the useful things to try to measure? And if there are some some deeper issues with a particular project, perhaps a, a place where that project, or even even you know conceptually conceptually, there can be conversations about what does health mean in the context of hyperledger and the uh, and a community here. Um, and I think you know you you'll also see more metrics work um, being done going down the road. Um, and this can, you know, which I think might result in software sitting in labs or maybe even a full-fledged uh, project proposal at some point. But this can be a place where I, I conversations about what, what are useful metrics to try to track um, and conversations like we had about, about the diversity topic, for example. It can be a home for that and a place to kind of focus those conversations into um, some sort of tangible output, you know. Um, uh, like we do with our other working groups, and we can always talk about architecture and identity and performance at the TSC call, but having separate working groups for that allows a degree of, of um, focus and, and bundling, um, uh, not to silo it off, but to just give it a, a, a proper home and uh, something to check in on on a regular basis. So I hear two... I hear two... Do you see this as a, you see this as a metrics group or as a best practices group? Exactly. You know, I don't know that those two are need, need to be separate from each other. I, I think, uh, yeah. And I'm not suggesting that they have to be separate from one another, but, but I hear two themes in the descriptions that you have. One is sort of the metrics and how do we measure. And the other that I heard from Dan and Tracy earlier was, well, maybe what we should be doing is figure out the best ways to build community as well. And, well, there's and another both of those dimension. are valuable. Right. There's so, a different dimension, which is whether it's only defining the matrix or it's actually applying those metrics to measure and produce results like measurements on how the different projects are doing against those metrics, which yeah. is the police angle that was referred <clears throat> to before. Right. So, so I, I, and I want to make sure that Vipin gets a chance because he was trying to, to chime in the same time that Mick did. So Vipin. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think... Um, Mick said what I wanted to say, which is that there is this double uh, sort of aim. One is, so, so is the group going to be much more of helping people or is it going to be more like saying, oh, you're not doing the right things. We're gonna tell you that this is, this is the right way to do stuff. And yeah. if, if that is the way that uh, the whole group is going to be formed and, uh, um, uh, going that direction, then uh, I have serious objections to it because uh, already uh, the working groups are, uh, you know, working hard to create content 
and to create value. Now to have one more group hovering over the whole thing saying, oh, you know, you guys uh, should be doing this. So we, yeah. we, we come to the TSC with a full disclosure of the metrics. So now if you want to add more metrics, then have it in the quarterly report. If it, the aim is to help people to increase diversity, to increase, like Dan said, then I'm all for it. Yeah. So I, 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 I want to echo what Nick and Vipin and Arno were saying, because I think it's fine if we have formal, um, you know, and consistent way of measuring things like the number of contributors, the diversity of the contributorship, the number of maintainers, the diversity of the maintainers, again, all the different facets, um, uh, you know, how many commits, how many releases, all those things that we can, uh, and, and I'm okay with having a group to sort of maybe harden a little bit about what we already have in our quarterly reports in that regard, right? Because the quarterly report already basically asks the various project teams to report those things, right? Now, maybe that could be refined a little bit, and again, maybe there can be a focus on the developing tooling and so forth that allows us to, to be a little bit more formal about that and maybe even create some sort of a dashboard that the TSC and others could use. I'm also fine with having discussions about how do we, as a community, uh, improve our ability of outreach and attracting new contributors, new, uh, you know, uh, uh, people to our various projects and helping, you know, and, and maybe even articulating some best practices that um, can be shared with the various teams. What I'm really very uncomfortable with is the middle bullet of the work products, which is quarterly reports on the status of all the working groups and projects, because we're already doing that. And I, I think to Vipin's point, now we have sort of the checkers of the, it, it's like, I, I thought that was our job here in the TSC is to review those reports and provide immediate and, you know, sort of pointed and helpful, hopefully constructive feedback. And now we have a working group that's going to be reporting on what they think the health is. I, I don't like that at all. Again, I'm fine with the discussion about how do we improve the reporting? How do we improve, you know, how do we do a, a more rigorous approach for counting things? But uh, and and what are the ways that we can increase diversity? That we can increase our contributors and so forth. I'm all for that um, as a separate discussion. I think we need to go back to the 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 first statement in the introduction of the charter, which you know is an assertion that I basically your question and I think rightfully is you know it says the health and viability of projects and working groups is not well understood, is it? I, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm deluding myself. I have the feeling that I get a pretty good sense of what's going on thanks to all these reports we are f forcing people to get through. And so, I, you know, maybe we need to get back to, you know, what exactly, what problem are we trying to solve? Well, I think uh, a couple things came to mind as I was looking through this. One is uh, completely different from what we've, we've talked about so far, but I, I think there is an interesting uh, mention down in, in the proposal that this would be, this working group would start off by not having regular phone calls because the, uh, the, the time slots that, uh, it's, it's hard to find a time slot that's ge geographically um, acceptable across all those all those different time zones so there might be some different ways of just operating here that that might be interesting the other thing that stuck out here uh was actually more in conversation that um uh, i think <clears throat> it was uh heart that that i was discussing this with with and he, and he made the observation and i think he might be on if he wants to make this uh, himself right now that that there's subject matter experts that will be looking at say privacy or architecture or or other things this seems like a forum where we could draw in contributors from our companies who are subject matter experts in recruiting and diversity and so on so that those of us that might not have that experience or those skills aren't trying to 
uh, reinvent the wheel or maybe arrive at counterproductive solutions. Right, and I, I sort of viewed this as building community health, building ecosystems, things like that, versus an overlord. Um, yeah. You know, and I think Red Hat could yeah. come in and help here a lot. Um, but yeah. what Dan was talking about sounds more like best practices again, which is different from metrics and reporting. Yeah. Could we maybe... I, I can see how the second um, work product was phrased in such a way as to, to trigger some of this response. Um, and probably, because I think where it came from was this idea that um, some of the scripts that Tracy has written and Chris, I know you've written and others might be usable in the form of a sort of dashboard sort of that might come out uh, or, or some sort of, you know, regular, regularly run kind of metrics kind of output, which the, you know, self-reporting um, from the projects the TSC doesn't have right now. Um, but that instead of just dumping metrics, you know, the, that the community health working group or, or perhaps, you know, the hyperledger staff would help um, the projects interpret those numbers um, and you know kind of like the weatherman looking at at you know weather data <laughs> might help uh, give a sense you know kind of a, of a summary of that not not to replace or, or uh, to run for the projects their their quarterly updates to TSC so I think I was phrased kind of clumsily and probably could be improved to to be more specific to that and, and not not come across as a as a uh, competitive thing to the uh, the quarterly reports the TSC yeah so I kind of uh, viewed this group as more of a resource to working groups and projects rather than a, uh, a policeman and may, you know, so, so the point was that if the working, some working group was having issues or, um, or some project was having problems, then this group would kind of be a collection of open source veterans who could help out. Um, and, and I think that might be useful for, people you know that may not have been around the open source community for as long or are kind of experiencing growing pains or something like that and i think if maybe the maybe the the proposed charter could reflect that a little more so um i was going to come in with a point very much along those lines um and, and i think i like that idea uh, so could this be shifted to be more of an intervention group uh some kind of a like task force. So if I think about in, from my own experience with Burrow, um, we don't have, you know, the need to interpret some kind of big data metrics around contributors. You know, I, I know everyone who, who will have contributed. And I know a lot of the areas where I could do with some help to say, for example, have someone who has expressed an interest actually be handheld uh, over the course of a month. So you could perhaps imagine a situation where you have a batch of quarterly reports and maybe uh, a group like this could specifically uh, target some interventions over the next quarter or maybe a month in the next quarter to actually ap apply some resources to try and fix a specific problem. Um, and in the, the, the conversation that's happening around diversity, for example, one of the things that came up again was, you know, actually uh, encourage and cajole people to stand for things or to go and, go and do things. So like, I mean, community harassment working group, uh, uh, harassment is an unfortunate choice, but in, in terms of like, <laughs> actually harass them into the, doing good, you mean? Because <laughs> what happens, so what happens with, for, for me is with people that um, have expressed interest, I'm, I, I get distracted onto my day job, having tried to get them started, yeah. and maybe that's when they fall off. Whereas if yeah. there was a dedicated resource that we couldn't have all of the time, but we could have specifically, <clears throat> That, that would be a different task. Because I, I also don't like the idea of duplicating the uh, evaluation part that the TSC does, but if it was an intervention thing, a task force, that's different. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, this is, Silas, to that point, actually, a lot of projects as they, you know, as they mature, uh, or organizations, you know, they tend to develop uh, um, uh, that particular type of a role where you actually have people that are, you know, doing a lot of what I know Tracy and I'm sure Rye uh, are, and, and David are doing in terms of, you know, going out and saying, here's how you land your first commit and so forth. And that, you know, that in a general way, that's, that's fine. But, you know, sometimes it's also just helping people sort of navigate through where are the issues and which one should I work on and can I add a new feature, all those kinds of things where sometimes people just need that extra sort of onboarding kind of support. And if, if that, you know, again, but that's a very different thing than coming up with just best practices. 
um, you know, that's actually sort of a role that people start to take on and, and, and then they spend a lot of time and, and invest a lot of time in either presenting that or, you know, serving in that function within the community as a sort of a social um, uh, lubricant, if you will, to, to get people onboarded. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that health is uh, very important in the community. And uh, I also believe that there's already the sharing goals for each of the working group. And uh, the uh, most important uh, output of the, uh, in the group chart is uh, the metrics and uh, best practice. Both are good things to the community. But uh, my only question is that, uh, is this outcome actually uh, almost, the, almost the inside the scope of the TSC? So well, that's that's cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah, do we need a, a, a yeah, do we need a special working group for that? So one of the things I'll just say one of the things that I hoped that would come out of something like this working group is uh, we have lots of phone calls and it's not clear they're optimally scheduled. Mm. So if this working group say, you know, did a bunch of the research and came back and said, hey, Hey guys, you know, we tried a bunch of stuff and in our experience, you know, this phone call schedule works best for this kind of group to maximize your participants, you know, and then they could say like, maybe you could try it if you think your working group looks like this or something like that. So, so that's what I was kind of hoping for. Um, so I, 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 I think that's in the charter. Um, is, is that kind of what the people had in mind for stuff like this or? So I, I think I'll just add a couple things and then I know we do have a kind of a meaty topic following this. So I don't want to delay this too much, but um, you know, obviously there's a hypothesis that we're not very geographically diverse, right? Um, that our working groups and, and when they're held are, are not conducive to people joining, right? Uh, I know we, um, we specifically are impacted by that. Um, I am specifically impacted by that based on some of the times that some of our calls happen. Um, and, and I'm sure other people are as well, right? And so we wanna make sure that we're opening up Hyperledger to the, the majority of people. And then secondly, you know, if we think about back to Nathan's project update where he, you know, reported that he has some, uh, you know, he, w he wants to get more people involved, but he's not quite sure how to do that, um, you know, and I think the TSC nodded to that and say, yeah, we need to find a better way for that. Um, but nothing's been done, right? We, we haven't necessarily made any progress on that. Well, uh, specifically, right? I, I think, you know, David and I and Rai went back in after that, that call and said, okay, well, what are the sorts of things that we could, um, you know, do on the India project to make it more conducive to new contributors coming in and that sort of thing. And, have we written up some notes and, and provided that to Nathan? Um, and I think that's the sort of thing that we want to continue to be able to do is, is to help where there, there's, there's things that need to be helped, but do it on a much wider basis. So it's not a, a one-off, right? Where we're only helping one project. We're truly coming up with what are the sorts of things that all of our projects should be doing to make sure that we can bring in uh, diversity and we can bring in additional contributors and that sort of thing. So I think that's where our head was, right, is, is let's see if we can um, prove or disprove some of the hypothesis that we do have about the health of our, um, our community and, and what are the specific things that we can do to make sure that we're, if those hypotheses prove to be true, we, we figure out how to make a difference, right, make an impact in, in improving it so that um, other people can contribute. Hey, um, I've got a quick question. This is Dave Hughesby. Um, does the Linux Foundation have any like YouTube videos where the topic is, so you want to contribute to open source and it, you know, starts from the very beginning, like, you know how to program or you know how to translate or you, you just care and want to, to join in. I don't think yeah, there are ever, I don't think I've ever seen a video like that, hmm. which assumes that you know nothing. yeah but i don't know that it's for linux generally or you know the whole linux foundation and all the collaborative projects as much as i know that for instance kubernetes um uh, does right they're um you know again they, they've cultivated this role of sort of 
community advocate that gets out there and helps people on board and provides this kind of feedback and so forth. I mean, that's their job, right? It's kind of like the, the role that Ryan, Tracy, and, and Dave play in terms of, um, uh, but, but again, that's a paid role. Whereas I know in Kube, it's a, it's a, it's a volunteer, you know, you've got people like Sarah, um, Novotna, who, Novotna rather, who's, who's, you know, that's her, that's, that's her primary function is to sort of be the, the yeah, one and that gets the, out there and drives, you know, increasing diversity and drives additional contributors and Tracy did a webinar. Tracy did a webinar entirely on this too. Mm -hmm. And that recording is there and it's been um, up and it is, it is promoted. And there's some other broader LF stuff that has been done and, and I know more coming down the pipe. Right. Um, but anyways, this is, this is a, a group to have those kinds of conversations within, like, is there content to create that sort of thing? Right. And, and I sort of viewed this, I mean, I had made a comment in the email thread that I think there's a big difference between some of the working groups and some of the projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like Fabric, most of your people, you know, the, or the developers working on it are probably getting paid to do that job. Where I think some of the working groups, it's much more volunteer effort. And uh, so, I, you know, I think there's a difference in, in trying to figure out and understand those differences because maybe what we need to do with the working group is different than what you need to do with a big project like Fabric or Sawtooth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this would be a way for the, you know, maybe working group is too strong, a, you know, too, too much organization, but, you know, maybe some kind of committee to go off and understand those things. I know the performance and scale working group, um, I didn't feel we were making a lot of progress at one point, so we went from meetings every other week to a weekly meeting, and I felt things took off when we did that. And I know personally, if, you know, I have an hour meeting and I have a two hour action item that's due in two weeks, I'm not going to do it till just before the next meeting. <laughs> and I think, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of- other Nobody else is like that at all. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that doesn't yeah. get the stuff out there for discussion. Um, yeah. Whereas if it's weekly, then that's, you know, right on my list of things to do. And if it's not uh -huh. part of my day job, you know, it, it's hard enough getting it near the top of my priority. Yeah. So I think understanding those differences is good. Maybe we don't need a working group for that, but um, you know, a way to go through and do that and help new groups when they form mm -hmm. you know, um, versus you know, an overwatch on Fabric or Sartooth. I don't think we need that, but you know, what can we learn from, from those projects or other working groups that have you know, gotten a white paper out? We had Hart come and talk to the PSWG about you know, okay, this is what you're gonna to need to do now that you're gonna, you know, you're getting ready for a tech writer and things like that. And that was val very valuable to us. So I, th I think there's a need for something. Um, if it's yeah, I, 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 yeah, so Mark, I, I, I totally agree. I just, I guess, you know, the, the, uncom the, the discomfort I have, I should say, is with the whole reporting on the report, you know, on the, on the projects and the working groups, because I don't think, and I think that's also in the TSC chat, we don't necessarily want to set up some sort of an adversarial type of a, a situation there. But I do think that, you know, having uh, discussions on how do we increase diversity, you know, from both a, um, uh, you know, at all, all of the, the different things and how do we go about and attract new contributors and how do we address the fact that a lot of stuff is sort of uh, paid development versus volunteer or, you know, contributions. Um, I, I'm happy to have that kind of a conversation. Although again, I, I you know, I, I tended to think that as we do the re various reports, those kinds of things come up and we have um, solid discussions here in the TSC and I wouldn't want to, divert that necessarily. I think we still need that. Um, and um, so anyway, there we are. I, 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 maybe if we just sort of modified the charter so that it's not so much um, uh, some sort of oversight as much as it is a set, you know, coming up with an initial set of recommendations and then, you know, maybe periodically, uh, I, I think, um, uh, and now I forget who was that suggested it, um, maybe Silas, you know, that when issues come up, then the team can convene and, and sort of do some, some deep thinking and report back to the TSC on what they thought. 
Does that make sense? Okay, so maybe yeah, uh, Tracy and Rye, you guys have enough feedback to, uh, and everybody else who wants to uh, constructively work on that, have enough feedback, and we can uh, give some time then to the rest of the agenda topics here. Yep. I'll I'll take that as a yes. I think I think you're on mute still, Tracy. So, um, thank you, and and Rye, um, and David if he's on. Look. Um, okay, next up is composer Simon. Hey, um, I don't know whether everyone has had a chance to read the update I put in this morning, along with the letter to the mailing list from the IBM contributor team. I posted them in the TSE channel. Um, on Rocket yes, Jack. you might want to read the uh, the email um, whilst I'll go through the update, and then maybe we can discuss the email, which is probably the more interesting part of it. Um, firstly, apologies that this is uh, four weeks overdue. Um, it's summer in the UK, so I've been off for quite a few weeks. Um, but anyway, let's move on. Um, so in the past quarter, um, we continue to see significant amounts of activity on Rocket Chat and Stack Overflow from people trying out Composer, using it, hitting issues, and asking how they can do certain things. And uh, as, as always, um, the IBM team has offer two full-time people to help work with those users and get them up and running, um, answering the questions. Um, we're also continuing to see um, contributions from outside IBM, but these are, again, still really minor contributions such as doc fixes, typo fixes, that kind of thing. Um, but we have released a, a new major version, uh, Composer 0 0.20, so 0 0.20, rather, um, and this release has a small set of features since 0 0.19, which I discussed on the last quarterly update. Um, but it, uh, the major new thing in this version is that it supports um, deploying to Fabric 1.2, um, so allowing you to use some of the latest features in Fabric. Uh, the new features specific to Composer are um, the ability to generate a loopback application project using the Yeoman generator. One of the uh, regular pieces of feedback we got from the community is um, You've got this great REST server, it's really easy to get started um, and up and running, but I need to customize it to do X, where X is add my own APIs, or um, add my own authentication mechanism, or just add my own code to it. And you can really do that because we just packaged up a REST server and you don't really have a chance to edit it without pulling down the composer code yourself and, and tweaking it. So the, um, the new generator generates a REST server on disk, you can edit the code to your heart's content. Um, we've also update, made some changes to transaction processor functions. Um, the first one of which is um, exposing a fabric functionality where a blockchain transaction, one has executed the smart contract, can return data from that smart contract. And this is basically a performance improvement because what we were seeing is that people would submit a transaction, they weren't able to send any data back with that transaction, so they had to then send another request into the smart contract to say, oh, could you get me the updated data? And this sort of bypasses the need for that second query. Uh, you just submit one transaction and it returns the updated data that you need. And the second update to transaction processor functions is being able to mark them as do not commit um, or read only. Um, and this is to solve another common community requirement where in Composer before, if you wanted to query assets or participants that were stored on the blockchain, um, you were limited to uh, our sort of CRUD operations, so get all or get by ID, or writing queries using the Composer query language, which is a SQL-like language for um, selecting data on assets. Uh, being able to mark a transaction processor function as do, got, do not commit means it's basically the same thing as a query function where you can write any code you want for querying data from the blockchain network. Um, and this lets you use any of the Composer and Fabric APIs to do whatever querying you like. And additionally, on top of that, filtering of that data, but on the server side, rather than having to pull it all back to the client application and uh, filter it there. So again, it really uh, came about as, the, as a performance requirement, but it's also useful for exposing uh, additional functionality to users. 
Um, in terms of contributor diversity, um, I've listed them all in the project update. We've had various uh, small PRs, as I mentioned, from uh, several other companies. I won't, I won't go through them all here. Um, and we haven't changed our list of maintainers since the last project update. Um, any questions on that? Yes, um, uh, thanks for the reporting. Uh, actually, I was asked the, this question uh, by several people. So uh, do you know, uh, is there any um, protection usage to, uh, uh, to include the Hyperledger Composer? Um, so at the moment, um, within IBM, we know of one production project using Composer. Okay, uh, can you share more details? Um, it's a, uh, not sure how much I can say, but it's a European banking consortium doing a trade settlement. Okay, thanks. We know what that means. <laughs> 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 Any, anyway, um, I'm, only a a worker. I'm not sure what I can say and what I can't say. So, uh, I'll <laughs> well, you've said enough. Uh, and, uh, couple of questions for you. One is that email uh, that you mentioned. I read both the um, the report of the status and the email. The email somehow seems to imply that there is uh, a chance that Composer, it is the sunset of Composer, or uh, that you are uh, reducing investment in it, uh, IBM is, and yes, he that that it is going to be phased out in a sense. But I do also see some green shoots there, which is uh, Selman's um, proposal for a model, uh, modeling language that would be uh, platform independent, which was of course the dream of uh, the composer in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first question. The second is, uh, why should you use composer uh, Meaning, is there anything that can be done in Fabric, uh, except for, let's say, private data objects, 1.2 stuff, that cannot be done um, uh, with Composer? Uh, so I'll go for the, the second question first, as I think that's easier to answer. Do you mean, did you mean, is there anything you can do in Composer that you can't do in Fabric or the other way around? the other way around. I mean, I hope there is nothing you can do in Fabric. I mean, in Composer that you cannot do ultimately in Fabric because that's the only system you have. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just code, right? Um, so yeah, there are things, um, plenty of things in Composer uh, that you cannot do whilst you can do them in Fabric. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the reasons you will see in that email for um, IBM's decision. Um, one, the example I quoted is private data collections. Um, now, whilst we have exposed all of the underlying Fabric APIs from within Composer, private data collections requires additional configuration to be uh, provided as part of deployment. And currently, we don't expose the APIs or command lines that allow you to provide private data collection configuration, um, which is why you can't use it with Composer today. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I did uh, explicitly call out uh, private data collection as not yeah. my focus. Is there anything else? Um, there will be other things um, coming up. Um, so certainly in Fabric 1.3, there's work being done with Identity Mixer. That will not just magically start working. Composer, um, when we start to support Fabric 1.3, um, that will again require changes to Composer to enable it. Those are the, the two main ones in my head. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that uh, you don't have a you know, smooth upgrade path because of the way things are set up. But in terms of the uh, existing one, like let's say 1.1, are there any things that uh, you for cannot For 1.1, I think we're okay. Okay. Uh, then Is of there course, direct support for the policy? I didn't think so. Say that again? Mm -hmm. 
I said, is there direct support for supporting all the various policy derivatives that you might have for how many endorsements to retrieve and all that you stuff? Can, I don't you can think. provide the endorsement policy during deployment, so that bit's fine. Okay. Um, although saying that, I don't think we really respect the endorsement policy in terms of picking. Uh, that's which. kind of what, okay, that's the <laughs> part that was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's nice to have a policy, but then if you can't follow it, then it doesn't yeah. really help you. Yeah. Well, we try to follow it. We just send it to everyone. As, as oh, I see. Okay. And then, <laughs> and, and, and then you get a bunch back that don't matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But <clears throat> I, I hope that's sort of clear is that when, when new features go into Fabric, it's not just a matter of them magically appearing in the Composer. There is a significant yeah. amount of work to be done to re-expose them in Composer. Right. And uh, I, I just wanted to... Oh, go ahead, Vipin. You had another question. No, 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 just the first question, which is the sunset uh, of Composer. Yeah, so the, the statement in the email, um, and I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, is that it's an IBM resource decision where my team in IBM, who is tasked with the developer experience for blockchain, is uh, reducing the amount of work we put into Composer to focus on delivering updates to Fabric. That doesn't mean we're dropping off the face of the planet and leaving Composer to itself. We're gonna to continue to update it to support the latest Fabric releases. And if any high priority bugs come along, then we'll pick those up and fix them. But we're not gonna be doing any new feature work. Um, and that's not a forever statement at this time. That's a, we might be back, we don't know. But for the time being, most of my team will be working directly on Fabric instead of Composer. Right, and to, to make sure that we're clear it's maintaining compatibility with the existing set of capabilities that composer has with respect to fabric one to that, yeah that that's that's a good point um and that is so when 1.3 comes out we will update it to run on a 1.3 fabric but we will not update composer to support the 1.3 features unless they are simply api updates that can be used without exposing additional configuration or, or and, and then, uh, right. And then to, to so, the, the point that I was going to be adding is that, you know, again, as the sort of the having the responsibility of your team of addressing sort of the, the developer experience and so forth, um, you know, a lot of thought was also given to the fact that our the existing SDKs are really very sort of granular, you know, sort of low level detail kind of stuff, not really very well um, the, the user experience isn't the greatest, let's just say. You can do a lot with it, you can do a hell of a lot with it, but, uh, or with all of them, right? Uh, Node and Go and, and so yeah. forth. But the, the problem is, is that the, they expose too much. And so from a developer experience perspective, you don't have the simplicity that you might have with something like Composer that is essentially hiding a lot of the gory details about how you under, you know how do you retrieve the endorsement policy and then how do you prepare a, a, a proposal for each endorser and ship it off and compare results and all that kind of stuff right so a lot of that stuff gets hidden in composer whereas with the SDKs you have to manage that all yourself um, yeah and so a lot of the focus is on improving that UX from an SDK perspective right so um, uh, so that the SDK and then the, you know, the, the ability to write chain code and so forth is, is significantly simplified, right? Yeah, and, and I cover that in the, in the mail. So uh, as you touched on there, the Fabric SDK, if you want to submit a transaction to a Fabric network, wait for it to be committed and be notified of that. That's, that's somewhere in the region of like 50 lines of code. And in Composer, that's five lines of code. Um, and as Chris mentioned, we hide a huge amount of interactions with the Fabric SDK in Composer. Um, and this is really wrong. Um, we, Composer was never designed just to make Fabric easier to use. Um, it was designed to make it easier to take your business use case and map it into a running blockchain network. Um, and that's why we have the modeling language. Um, and this also provides a huge amount of confusion we've seen where someone sees a composer application that has you know a five lines of code to connect to a network and submit a transaction and then they see the fabric version of that and they're like how do these two actually map together are they doing the same thing is composer just doing magic um and that's that's another one of the reasons for our 
for our yeah. current plans. Uh, Simon, this is Leonard. Just a quick question here. Um, thanks for that update. I was just wondering about the modeling aspect of Composer. Um, is that, will that eventually disappear based on this sensitive clause? Or will you provide for business use where they can actually model their blockchain environment and not have to worry too much about the uh you know sort of the the the, the very detailed programming um, aspects to capture their business requirements their business rules and the smart contracts that would need to be generated will you com continue to provide a a, a a modeling interface for better uh, business user experience in in designing their their, their blockchain uh you might say uh network that, okay so that's a Great question. So firstly, a Composer isn't going anywhere. We're not going to delete the code or the website or any of that. So you can continue to model your blockchain use cases using Composer. Um, we strongly believe that modeling your blockchain networks is the way forwards. We've had so much good feedback around the modeling language and how much easier it makes development and how much better it is at engaging the business people in the development of blockchain solutions. Um, and at the bottom of the mail, you'll see uh, a reference to some work Dan Selman is proposing to do. He is on the call um, where we sort of look at pulling out the modeling language from Composer as it is today. Um, Dan is using the modeling language in the work he's doing in Clause. Um, we obviously use it in Composer. We could take that modeling language and embed it into other blockchain platforms as well. For example, into Fabric, into Sawtooth, you know, it's, it's a library that lets you describe a blockchain business network um, or a modeling language that lets you do that and a library that lets you uh, write programs that interact with that model. So it's really valuable code. Um, maybe it is worth pulling that out and managing it as a separate project. Hey, it, it's, uh, if I can just jump in for a sec, because I do think we should leave some time. We're seven minutes uh, to the end uh, for the Cello update. Um, uh, and conversation there, but uh, just really quick, a I want to thank um, I want to thank you, Simon, for the transparency uh, that you're bringing to kind of uh, the in internal IBM resource discussions and decisions. Um, and b uh, I, I, I think I, it, this is an inflection point for the project. It doesn't necessarily mean the project uh, should be wrapped up. Um, it's kind of saying the current direction, you know, is one that gives a lot of people uh, uh, who've been involved with the project concerned about, about, about the direction and, and that's leading to perhaps a change in, in leadership. I think the follow-up questions should be, what does this mean for the future of Composer? Um, and that kind of conversation should really happen on the Composer developers mailing list. And now might be the time, if any of you have used Composer, have found value in its existence in terms of recruiting new people into the community um, to kind of direct your attention or, or other people's attention over to that list um, and start the conversation there of what might a 2.0 of Composer look like? What might a modeling language future look like? Um, and, and does it make sense to have a, a standalone thing like Composer or plugins for other dev tools out there, IDEs, you know? Uh, I can say it's ex been extremely helpful to be able to say, here's a pathway for not just the elite developers like all of you, but for average developers to be able to bootstrap and start building in, in, the, in the context of a hackathon, an app <laughs> that demonstrates doing a blockchain thing, right? Um, even if that wasn't a toolkit for get, taking it all the way to production, right? If it was just, even though it was just kind of a taster. Um, but I, and I think we need something like that. And I think even a, a very radically different uh, approach and code base could carry the mantle of a composer 2.0, um, uh, but it needs to be rejuvenated. And I respect IBM's decision to make its internal kind of resource decisions, but where to put its people, like I would for any company, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage us to now think right now too much at this at the TSC level what the future of composer should be. Let's direct it over there. But I do want to thank uh, Simon and 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 obviously IBM, the rest of IBM for having put so much into Composer and giving us something that's, that's been so strong um, uh, in, in bringing in new, new developers to the community. So sunset, do, sunset does imp imply sunrise tomorrow, so. 
You're an optimist, no. though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and even the Apache web server project started when uh, a bunch of student developers on the NCSA code all got hired away by Netscape, and the rest of us users kind of looked at each other and said, well, I guess we got to take over. So a, completely po uh, a complete possibility is that you know, the users of Composer kind of have this moment of self-actualization, too. Um, but I'd like to leave the, the door open for that and also say like the project could continue even if the approach and the code base underneath uh, take a radical change because I think what people think of as Composer is <clears throat> on ramp and, and I even like the idea of making it more framework agnostic, making it higher level and not so deep in the weeds with fabric as, as the current mm -hmm. approach. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like people, I know we don't have time for a deeper discussion now, but this ties back to the previous discussion we had on the community working group type of thing. You know, if we had some organizational thing there that could help here, you know, for um, so when a company decides that it can't invest its resources in a project it's been sponsoring, you know, is it completely up to the community to figure it out or is there some type of organization within Hyperledger that could help figure out how it picks up the pieces and keeps going. Because there might be users outside of IBM that are gonna get, you know, left in the dust here if they can't pony up resources to do it on their own. I think there's a, a complementary flow of that too, of that information that I, I have viewed Composer as a, a very successful project in terms of popularity. And I, I read from your notes, Simon, that that hasn't necessarily translated into contributors. And so feedback yep. in assuming that we get this working group moving forward, feedback into that working group about what didn't work, even if we didn't figure out what would work, I, I think would be helpful. Mm. Yep. Okay, so we have two minutes left and that's really not fair to Jello. Bawa and team, I'm hoping that we can defer until next week, is that okay? Okay, let's do it last week. All right, thanks, Bawa. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so so I would um, like to thank everybody. I think this was a, a help, healthy discussion. Um, I think that the point on you know you know having something that's wildly popular and yet you don't see a whole lot of return on having new people come and join. I think that's pretty much across the board, to be honest. I mean, there are, I mean, you know, to, uh, to some of the projects, there are more uh, contributors and then there's a greater diversity, but it's still, I think there's still quite a few, especially ISVs and, and even major vendors that are using some of these, uh, some of these platforms and or tools and not really contributing much back. So um, I think there's a lot we can do in, in that regard. And I, I think having a discussion on that would be, would be valuable. Um, whether it's in the TSC or in the, in the working group. So anyway, so thanks everybody and we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Welcome Bye. back, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, welcome back. Bye. Bye.